Welcome to the Mobile Games Playbook in association with Liftoff. Join us as we uncover the latest trends in user acquisition, monetization, and mobile game design. Hello, and welcome to the Mobile Games Playbook. Thanks for tuning in for another episode. This is a podcast all about what makes a great mobile game, what is and isn't working for mobile game designers, and all of the latest trends. I am your host, John Jordan, and in today's episode, we are looking to what's going to be happening in 2024, so a very exciting one to have, and uh, joining us as our experts in what's happening, we have uh, Wilhelm Voltelainen and uh, Kale uh, Helkinen, who are both Chief Game Analysts at uh, Game Informer by Liftoff. How's it going, guys? Yeah, it's going really well. Uh, thanks for asking, Charna. It's, uh, <laughs> it's really snowy here in Helsinki, so, so I, I love it. <laughs> I was just uh, in Helsinki this week, uh, and I was surprised how cold <laughs> and snowy it was. Uh, so, uh, so there we go. <laughs> Good. So, um, I mean, this is pretty straightforward. This, th- these are always the exciting podcasts to do, the looking forward with the crystal balls and what's going to happen and all that sort of stuff, because uh, no one knows if you're going to be wrong. We can always listen, listen back in six months' time and see, <laughs> see how right you were. But this is the, this is the fun stuff. So um, we get, I think we're going to kick off with um, there's some games to look forward to, because that's always the... More, the most interesting bit, isn't it? That you, we have have some titles in mind that we're looking forward to playing. So, who wants to, who wants to start us off on those? Well, I can go first. So, uh, yeah, I think we could start with a with a genre that is not discussed uh, that much in the mobile scene. So, racing. So, there's a new title um, coming up, uh, getting a global release, uh, hopefully next year. That is called Racing uh, Master. It was launched in China uh this uh summer uh and has had a relatively good uh good a year uh this 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 far so so racing space is something that is has been quite stagnant in, in recent years but but this is this is a title that could bring some new blood to the to the, to the genre so it's it, it comes from uh net is and also codemasters has been collaborating with the game um and looks looks just gorgeous and yeah, just a couple of things to highlight about that one is that it has a very strong focus on a story-based carrier carrier mode, which is which is quite interesting. A lot of customization options uh, for cars, and I guess one interesting tidbit is that uh, the game gradually suggests the player to lower the level of control assistance as he plays more and more uh, the game. So that's kind of an interesting one there. I think like we have been definitely waiting for like a huge racing hit to finally come to that west western market uh, and 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 yeah I agree the racing master looks looks beautiful uh, and of course there's like other upcoming racing games too like Disney Speedstorm for example more of just like arcade racing game from Gameloft that is actually looking quite good as well I think it was supposed to release already this month but I think they postponed it to the uh, to the January of of 2024 but yeah, it's maybe we will finally get something like going on in the racing space in the West. I guess it's one of those genres that can be quite hard to innovate in because you sort of either go down the like hyper hyper realistic route, which is you know which sort of is what everyone wants. Basically, people who make those games are normally massively petrol heads, so they they sort of want to make the most realistic thing, and then you end up with something that's so realistic that sort of hardly anyone can play it. And, and and that doesn't fit so well on mobile compared to PC, does it? So I guess then you sort of like, well, how are we doing doing that with arcade? Or, you know, it, it becomes, I guess from a design point of view, there's, you're, you're much more limited than you maybe would be in other sort of genres. Or then you just have to take the theme and bring that bring that to a totally new genre, like they did with Chrome Valley Customs and, and Mass Trees. Cool. Wilhelm, one, one from you. What have you got for us? So I think we could like look at the sub, what like upcoming the RPGs. So of course RPG space has been interesting pretty much every year. You know, last year we had Diablo Immortal and and and, and uh, lots of other interesting games as well. But some upcoming ones definitely interesting. Uh, Lost Ark Mobile. So Lost Ark uh, used to be a really popular game when it was released on on PC. So it's just kind of like top down MMORPG type of a game used to be really popular in west i think it's still really popular in korea 
So that's interesting when it's going to be released on mobile. Same for Path of Exile. So, you know, one of the biggest <laughs> competitors for the PC, Diablo games, uh, and going of this kind of like interesting free to play game on PC, but having no pay to win. So paying for convenience. And I think it's going to be the same. I think they announced that it's going to be the same on mobile as well. So it's going to be really interesting. How will they compete against Diablo Immortal, which is, has this, you know, pay to win elements there. And of course the monetization challenges, then, uh, if we look at, because all of these games are all these upcoming games, these Lost Ark and Battle of Exile, they are both single character RPGs. So you're not forming a team of characters. And those traditionally have not been that successful on mobile because it's really hard to monetize them. All the top monetizing RPGs are character collectors. You collect multiple characters, you form teams. So Diablo Immortal was the, you know, the only success in a long time in, in that sense. So. Well, it's going to be interesting to see how will Lost Ark and Battle of Exile do on mobile. Are they obviously sort of to some degree competing with Diablo Immortal for audience? Is that game now sort of old enough that there's sort of the people who have had sort of been playing that have sort of not had enough, but they're sort of like hungry now for a similar, well, not a similar experience, but, but, but another sort of RPG that's going to be deep? I think that's a good good. Good question, for sure. Uh, there might be players, of course, that you know are hungry for, for, to, to play, you know, Path of Exile, for example. But then, on the other hand, as you know, there's a deep progression layers in Diablo Immortal. There's also players that are super invested in in Diablo Immortal. They have spent, you know, their time, their money on getting this this massive progress characters. So it might also be hard for them to swap though. You know, you sort of want games that are sort of growing the market rather than just sort of, you know, competing within the market. I mean, I guess, I guess that's, all, that's always the, the the great goal for game designers is to have, is to take a genre and expand it because that's when you really get sort of success rather than just like, oh, you know, we, the, the cake's this big, we just need to take a bigger slice from someone else. That, 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 that's sort of a harder hard, harder thing to do, isn't it? Um, and, uh, okay, so so I guess another sort of uh, traditional IP coming to mobile, Calais, is uh, Assassin's Creed Jade, which is... I mean, should be should be should be great, shouldn't it? Don't we? You can tell me. <laughs> yeah, I guess this connects to the, to the to the RPG side of things as well. So, so definitely one of the most interesting games to follow and follow next year. But um, at this point, there's that, there's actually not that much to tell about the game. Of course, we've seen some videos of the gameplay, and it looks exactly what you can expect from an Assassin's Creed title. So, I suspect that that side of things they probably can can nail. Uh, and the game looks very good, uh, of course. But but definitely would be will be interesting to see what is their monetization approach going to be with this game. What kind of social elements are they going to ha- have there? And most of, most importantly, I would say that what is going to be their level of commitment to the live op- op- operations of this game. And um, yeah, I, it's actually interesting to to look at the the, the history of the Assassin's Creed franchise on mobile because that, that's quite interesting. Like this is technically speaking their 17th attempt on mobile with Assassin's Creed so when it comes to Ubisoft. But of course, many of those games were, were the sp- spin-offs of premium titles back in the day, like 2010, 2011, 2012 and, and, and stuff like that. But but like also, like just recently, a couple of years ago, they tried making, for example, an endless runner with that ip with the assassin's creed uh free runners for example so so um definitely seems to be an ip that they want to utilize on mobile as well so so let's let's uh hope that they they get it done with with jade this time around i can't say i've played all those 17 games i played some of them but uh, would you say this is sort of the <laughs> these these this is much more like the assassin's creed you would sort of type of game you'd expect on pc console on mobile which they've Tend, they've, they've, did you say they've tended to sort of do things, you know, genres within Assassin's Creed that would clearly work well on mobile? They've not really, you know, it's obviously very expensive to make these games. And, and so, so I guess that's the interesting point for this one. This is like, like a console type game. They're definitely. So the, the marketing this far and, and the scale of things, when if you look at the videos and stuff like that, it looks like that this entire, that level of focus for this game is on, you know, it's it's something else when it comes to the stuff that they've done previously on mobile with Assassin's Creed. So, so um, yeah, very interesting one to, to follow. The tricky thing is not necessarily making 
the sort of high end game that fits there. It's that success on mobile really comes through live ops, and as you sort of highlighted, that's we not very clear, and that's I guess sometimes what console developers have not you know they're just not set up in the way that mobile developers are to to really sort of um, optimize those live ops. Yeah, that that is the sort of biggest I guess um, concern I would personally have. Uh when it comes to to the long term success of, of of the title, but but as I said, like there's so little that we know at this point, so it's it's really speculative still. But it's certainly one you would think there'll be you know, headlines of you know when that game comes out because every Assassin's Creed, it's almost you know everyone wants to check it out, even if they sometimes you get the feeling some people want to check it out to criticize. It. <laughs> uh, what are we on to next, Wilhelm? Are you going to talk about? Um... Some more RPGs. Yeah, so I think like because now we're talking about this really high production value, like almost like console experiences. It's interesting to look at also like the some other like upcoming upcoming titles. So you have Zenless Zone Hero uh, from Mihoyo coming. So it's gonna be like you know kind of like similar game that we had, you know, the Genshin Impact, but it's more of like this non-open world game. It's more about like RPG, like action RPG where you play in like these smaller instances. But it looks, of course, it's Mihoya, so it looks the game looks amazing. Uh, you have other kind of similar games as well coming. So Project Mugen. So it has kind of like similar similar style style to it. And, and so really, I wanna highlight here that. What's what's really interesting is that the theme of the games are a bit different than your usual RPGs. So these are more of like, instead of being, you know, the fantasy team or sci-fi team, they are more about this street fashion team. I think this is also start, starting to rise in popularity in, 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 in Japan and maybe in, in China as well. So it's an interesting team to look at for sure. And, you know, the third, you know, really high, val- high production value, Wuttering Waves which kind of like looks quite similar to Genshin. So uh, it, it's really interesting when they, 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 if, if they get released next year. Uh, and really the, like the big thing in those games and like in many other of these games that we have mentioned already is the crossplay. So crossplay has been, you know, growing already and I definitely see crossplay being a huge trend in 2024 as well uh, with these upcoming games. You know, you have lots of benefits. Uh, you know, you, you are unifying the co- console, PC, uh, mobile audiences, and it also helps. You know, with the you know we've been talking about the app store fee bypassing. You know, with the web stores, so you can better utilize those as well. So it's it's well <laughs> the, the cross play a a titles. You know, coming to mobile, it's it's an interesting thing. And would all those three come from uh, APAC developers as well? So it's that's a guess. I guess it's because they're just so expensive to make those sort of titles that you sort of want to be making those from slightly lower cost um, <laughs> regions. That would have been actually my question to you guys. That do you know what's the sort of like common link between these these titles that were just uh, discussed? So so yeah, they all come from Asia. So I totally agree that like is it like my I guess my question is that is it so that nowadays. Uh, the Asian developers are the only one that have the muscle to compete in this uh, RPG space, which seems to require, a, you know, the the expectation expectation levels are so high for this genre that that it, are they the only ones who can you know deliver nowadays? Yeah, and then you need to nail kind of having the AAA game plus having the extreme mobile live ops combination to actually you know be super successful. So <laughs> you need <laughs> you need lots of like production value for that. And I guess the other thing is people are interested in that because they've seen the success of stuff like Genshin, which was you know um, you know I think an obviously amazing game, hundred million dollars or whatever to to develop. But uh, you know the success was amazing. It was really an outsized success. And as soon as you have one of those, is people are prepared to invest that amount of money or some people are prepared to invest that amount of money to, to try and repeat it. But then after a few people don't repeat it and basically end up losing a lot of money, then people then sort of look for another um, opportunity maybe. So so, so, so maybe the, the next year will be the, the high point of these sort of super expensive sort of 3D RPGs. And, or if they're successful, everyone will be making more of them, I, I guess, one or the other. <laughs> Kelly, you want to talk about... Uh, Two games, Earth, Earth Revival and Fading City. Tell us about those. Yes. Think they're interesting. Uh, just brief uh, mentions uh, about these these ones. So, so the Earth Revival and Fading City, they are two China originated uh, survival MMOs. So, still continuing mm-hmm. on the on the RPG okay. tip here. Um, mm-hmm. 
coming to the global market next year. So Earth Revival is actually from Newverse, uh, which has very, very, very strong Mass Effect vibes. And then Fading City from NetEase has very, you can see the influence from the Last of Us series, <laughs> like evidently there. So why I want to mention these titles is basically like the main reason is the fact that there are publishers and developers out there, obviously, that are looking at AAA titles and AAA IPs in the West, which don't have tangible presence on mobile. And these developers see mm. this as an opportunity to leverage those IPs indirectly. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that if you're an IP holder of a popular gaming franchise, you don't have a mobile presence, well, guess what it might what might happen? It might be that someone else will sort of fill the void for you. And I'm afraid that these cases that I just mentioned, they won't be the last ones that we're going to we're gonna see so so of course it will be interesting to see when these are globally launched that will they bump into some legislative issues for example because it is with these titles like i was looking at some trailers that they had for example from the earth revival which is the mass effect kind of game like the like the editing on the trailers mm -hmm. and stuff like that it's exactly the same as the trailers were for like mass effect 3 back in 2009 or something like that so that it was just like, it's really interesting <laughs> if we're going to see more of this. Let's just put it that way. Yes, yeah, so I guess it's, you probably can't copyright how you cut your video, but there's other things you probably could do, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like where you where do you draw the line? But 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 yeah, uh, I would just say that like uh, for all the IP holders out there that, that like, it, we, we're going to see some, I think we're going to see some interesting discussions uh, going forward when it comes to this this type of cases. You say those are from Chinese developers. So, so is it enough that those games could just be released in China, which would obviously sort of maybe curtail some of the copycat sort of issues and people just go, you know, everyone sort of in China knows it's sort of a, inspired by Mass Effect or something. But there's a sort of a different thing if you go global with it. I mean, they could just be successful within China, but maybe if they're sort of aggressive in their attitude, then they go, well, of course we can do it global because that's, you know. Yeah, that's a good point. Earth Revival is actually already launched in China. Uh, it's a top 50 crossing uh, uh, title there. Yeah, it was just uh, launched, I think, like one month ago or something like that. Um, and yeah, it's 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 very successful there. Uh, so yeah, I definitely, there's a point there that um, like operating these games in China, uh, probably from legislative perspective is much easier than when you then release them to the global and, and especially Western markets. So I think when that happens, uh, yeah, let's let's see. Of course, I haven't played those games personally, so I'm not 100% sure the like of the what what kind of things have been copied exactly. But looking at uh, videos and trailers, uh, it's very easy to see that what has been the source of inspiration for these games. Yeah, everyone's influenced by something. It's a case where you sort of cross the line. And also talking about sort of global launches, you want to Honor of Kings. Is Honor of Ki I thought Glo this was out ages ago but you're saying Honor of Kings isn't out. This is a confusing one. This is a super confusing one uh, for sure. So, so uh, why, why I wanted to brought this up is that, is that apparently there's again rumors that, that Honor of Kings, which if there's someone who doesn't know, is one of Kings is one of the biggest mobile games in the world, at least if you think about the games who have crossed the most. Um, so there's rumors that it would get a global release in 2024. Um, Honor of Kings was launched back in 2015 in China and it's been, been a success story, as I said. Always been top one crossing game in, in, in China, practically. Uh, and a Western version of Honor of Kings called Arena of Valor was released back in 2016. So that's what gets us very confusing about this one. So, uh, But that never received real, really a great success uh, that at least would be comparable to Honor of Kings in China. But this new global version of Honor of Kings was soft launched actually in Brazil last summer. Uh, you, you can take a look at some numbers, performance numbers of the game. They're pretty modest uh, when it comes to revenue and downloads. Uh, so yeah, really like it has been in the soft launch there for, for six months. So, so let's see what, what's going to happen. But the rumors are that they're going to, you know, uh, make a global uh, launch, long launch. Bit. So let's see. Um, 
but personally, I'm just a little bit confused about the so, sort of like the Tencent's plan here. So is, is are they going to run both Arena of Valor and Honor of Kings in the West? Or will Arena of Valor be killed at some point? Or will will the Honor of Kings Western version ever actually be global launched? The mobile scene is very hard to 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 enter, but I, I guess if someone can do it, then 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 Tencent, of course, has the experience and resources to to execute it. But then again, they sort of missed those expectations with Iron of Valor already. So so I'm 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 really confused about this uh, myself as well. Uh, Iron of Valor, it used to be in, in a kind of high ranks at the at the launch, like at the launch at the beginning of the game. But yeah, it has like of course obviously now dropped away. They have really slowed down with the with the live ops of the game and the updates. Uh, they like there's only like a couple of updates, new content per year, and they have really slowed down on that one. But well, <laughs> it's interesting to see how it how it does against Mobile Legends, Bang Bang, and the Wild Rift, so two of the biggest mobile games in the West. On the on mobile, so. But I guess from their point of view, if it's just that they can consolidate the live ops and just have one live ops team doing both, then that, that maybe that's enough to give it another try. It kind of makes more sense to also have the same like s- game with the same name as well, because that they don't feel so separate titles. So, in terms of like let's say esports, you know, which is big in these mobas. So, Wilhelm, um, shooters. We've talked a bit about about racing games, but uh, shooters are a perennial genre where everyone's launching and loads of stuff going on there. So what, what are we looking there? Yeah, so yeah, shooters definitely, well, it's one of the hardest genres to enter. It's still dominated by the big three games, you know, Call of Duty Mobile, PUBG and, and Free Fire in the West. Uh, so, but there's, you know, there's really, really promising games coming coming uh, 20, in 2024. First of all, Warzone Mobile, uh, which I would say that th- that game's strength and so I would say why that would, would be successful is because it will have cross progression battle bass with the PC version, and of course the PC version is extremely popular uh, game. So I think instead of you know directly competing against the mobile audience and against those big three, is that it can definitely bring uh, the COD uh, Warzone PC players. To, to mobile because you know let's say you have the battle pass plan which is by the way in in the in the in the pc version the battle pass plan it really takes time to progress because it's a time-based uh progression progression battle pass plan so it's you progress it uh by just playing the game like you know so time-based time-based uh, battle pass plan it takes a lot of time to progress so i i personally i wouldn't really mind to sometimes you know hop on my couch play some warzone mobile and continue the battle pass progression there so i can actually finish the battle pass in in time so i think that's a big strength that can really really make uh really work for them it's going back to your cross-platform thing isn't it yeah yeah, so yeah. Having a cro- the importance of crossplay that it just gives you you have an embedded audience there, so you know immediately that you know you're, you're adding benefit to those people straight away. At first, I was thinking that does it make sense to cannibalize the Call of Duty mobile audience? But then again, I guess maybe it it is more beneficial then to have the players play the Warzone uh, more than the Call of Duty mobile. Uh, I guess with Co- Call of Duty mobile, the, the, was it Tencent that is the code developer there gets a certain cut out of the profits there. So with Warzone, they're going to get all the cash for themselves. So maybe that's that's something to to incentivize them to focus on Warzone. Uh, and then, you know, some other games, you know, so Valorant and also Rainbow Six. So more of these uh, tactical shooters, so slower paced games compared to the Battle Royale titles, you know, the, may, the movement, uh, it's more slower paced, it's more tactical, and of course the time to kill is super fast, but you know, it's you know, it's really tactical. So I would say, like right now, there is none of those kind of games in the really high crossing ranks. You know, I think the highest crossing one in the in the Western West is the critical ops, which is I think is an amazing game. And I personally think those games are one of the best shooters, one of the best shooter genre that works on mobile because of the slower paced and more tactical movement that really works on the works better on the touch screen, I would say. So like for example, Valorant, it's a massive IP nowadays. It's super 
huge success on the, on the PC. I don't know if they, maybe they will do sim similar. So I have cross production Bellavas plan that would be like really work for them. And then of course, lastly, I want to really mention the div division resurgence. So <laughs> a looter shooter type of game. Uh, we have not seen a looter shooter in a long time, like being successful in the, in the, in the West, West uh, or the, on the mobile in general, I'd say. Uh, I think it's going to be tough to make it work uh, because, you know, balancing this power progression uh, shooter, it can be really tough. You know, how do you balance the gameplay and the monetization parts? There has been one, you know, game that has kind of made it work. So Pixelcom 3D, one of the actually oldest shooter games uh, on mobile there is, uh, that is still, still live and going really well. Uh, they actually have a power, power progression, progression element. So they have been able to make it work so division resolutions i think they have a, they have a chance yeah as a bonus i'm going to throw in just uh, high energy heroes um from tencent so we all know apex legends was was cancelled killed uh in the west but um tencent actually made a very similar looking game launched launched it in in china uh this year called high energy heroes if you look at the ui it's very similar to apex legends and and, and stuff like that the art style and aesthetics are a bit more leaning towards asian anime uh, looks and stuff like that so and it's it has performed pretty well in 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 china still i think in top 50 crossing um so of course uh, like, like there's no i didn't find any evidence that it would get a global uh, release but but who knows maybe maybe to it 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 it, it, it could but um but yeah, but definitely uh, when talking about new shooter games, it's uh, one to keep under radar. Going back to what you were saying about looking at gaps in markets where existing games, clearly in this case, you know, there isn't going to be an Apex Legends mobile because it's, it's dead. So a team like Tencent, who probably got loads of developers, worth a, worth a punt, isn't it? I mean, high energy heroes. I mean, that could work in the West, couldn't it? It's maybe not there. So plenty going on with shooters. Um, okay, let's talk a bit about, about that trends now. So we always talk about live ops, don't we? But uh, <laughs> um, let's do some live ops trends. Yeah, so let's start with the obvious. So the cost, scope, and importance of live ops will obviously grow also in 2024. So if you're launching a new game, the sad news is that all your competitors already have their live ops machines running. So you really need to have that live ops strategy in place. Um, in, to be more specific, we're seeing a lot of promotional collaboration events. So IP collaboration events in, in games and, and, and being very important part of their live ops uh, palette. Uh, so, for example, this year we see a lot of interesting ones uh, in games like Stumble Games, or for example, with uh, Monopoly events and Barbie uh, co collaboration events. And whenever I speak actually with our Honor of Kings analyst, so we, we mentioned Honor of Kings already in this podcast, she always says that there's some exciting IP collaboration event going on. And then would you, Wilhelm, agree with me that Events, just in general, they're becoming more sort of like surprising and exciting. So like make, putting out events that are like, just collect 10 pieces of Colin Gandhi and then, you know, reach this threshold and get a reward. Uh, it's just, you know, it's it's like we've seen that. And what we're, what is really resonating right now is that we're seeing more of these like more non-traditional events and, and mini games events and stuff like that. Yeah, the, like I would say that definitely the sort of the kind of like the production values of events are getting higher, uh, especially in this new, 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 newer type of events. Uh, so, you know, comparing, as Carlo mentioned, comparing a single, simple task event where there's literally just a task, do something in the core gameplay, get points, get rewarded. Comparing that to an event, let's say, where you do something in the core gameplay, then you play, let's say, a mini game with that, or build something like the event meta game or something, or even have an interesting UI or a team. It makes it so much more interesting and engaging for the players. Uh, some really good examples are Phase 10. They run these themed events every month, and they have exactly that. So there's always a new mechanic tied to the event sort of loop. Uh, and a new team as well, and also like this more, more of this interesting one of uh, one of events, and going like taking sort of trends from other games like Lily's Garden. They have run this makeover event, so which kind of like you know takes inspiration from the project makeover. And in instead of just you know you playing the match three core gameplay, you're getting points and rewarded. You're playing match three core gameplay, then you're using the points you get from that to 
uh, uh, kind of like do a makeover for the game's story character. And depending how far you get into the, in the makeover, the, end, the story ending of the event gets better and better. So there's lots of these interesting elements to it compared to, you know, <laughs> traditional task event. It definitely plays into the, uh, the, the cost, the scope and importance of live ops. <laughs> it's going to grow when, when, you just, when it just becomes a sort of, you know, it's, games within itself or you know special extra special rewards i mean that's just everything is becoming sort of complex and it's interesting you said wilhelm that a lot of those ones are social as well the events now so you sort of it's not just about you it's sort of about sort of deepening the core community of the game by having you know by just embedding people in, in, into things they're doing together yeah you have social elements you have meta elements you have a story many of those and yeah, yeah interesting stuff for sure and then like another trend is definitely i would say in, in terms of events is the new the games are finding new ways to monetize their events so like we've had we've seen past year we've seen lots of premium reward tracks in events so like this mini power passes inside events you know monetizing some of the events rewards and then we've seen that becoming becoming more popular and then we've also seen uh this kind of like uh event boosts so boost doing something or purchasing something to boost your progression inside the event that's usually what is lately been uh, like happening a lot is sort of if you have this event skin or this event character your progression in the during the event is sort of doubled. So for example, actually Modern Warfare 3 that ju just got released on PC, they are running events like that actually right now. So if you're purchasing the, uh, the single one unique operator that is promoted in the event, your progression, progression is faster. But, so those are kind of like what's already going on, but then what we have just recently seen, and I, I definitely see this, you know, becoming more popular in 2024 is this kind of like this pay that content so events being locked behind a paywall so for some examples is last fortress so one of the top forex strategy games you have to purchase this premium building in the game to actually access at this mini game event so the only way to access an event is you purchase this premium building which costs 50 dollars then uh on state of survival another you know one of the <laughs> other super successful forex uh there they had this resident evil collaboration event and to play some of the events inside the huge set of events, you actually had to pull this Resident Evil character from a gotcha. That's the only way to participate in the event and get anything. And then last, last really interesting example, Free Fire. They had this top-up event. So meaning top-up events mean that you have to sp spend or purchase certain a amount, certain amount of premium currency in the game. And that way you would unlock this huge set of different events so a whole massive set of events was locked on you spending or purchasing premium currency so pay gated content is i definitely see going to be a trend i find that very interesting because it's like going back to the roots of the live ops in like aaa premium titles i i i see this as a sort of form of a dlc where you have gameplay content locked behind a purchase or a pay paywall. Of course, the, the mechanisms are here not so straightforward and stuff like that, but it's, it's sort of like DLC in a, in, in a sense. Definitely sounds like one to look forward to. We'll check out how it's happening in 2024. And then last one, we I guess we wouldn't be allowed to do a podcast like this without mentioning AI. I don't know how deep we want to go into it because it's, I've just, there's obviously some very sort of obvious things we understand about sort of Gen AI and how that's impacting the, the sector, but I guess none of us are deep experts to exactly wheedle out what's exactly going to happen. But uh, how do we think AI is going to, the Gen AI stuff is going to is going to change things? Is, is it, I mean, maybe the contrary thing, is it actually going to change stuff in 2024 or, or is, is it just speeding up game development and making stuff cheaper and we don't actually notice it in games per se? Yeah, it's you know, like like you said, like we're definitely not the experts, but um, but it's always fun to speculate. So let's speculate. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, and I think it's of course like talking about two thousand twenty four. Like, uh, you just have to touch upon the topic of AI, AI, I guess, and uh, uh, and it surely has replaced blockchain and metaverse as the gaming industry buzzwords, right? So, and and rightly so. I mean, the the potential to disrupt how games are made is 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 frankly speaking huge. So, so if we, for example, think about the high level implications and and what it means to the industries, if industry if developing games will get much quicker and and much less complex. And I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad thing, obviously, but it's already if you think about it, it's already ridiculously hard to find an audience to your game. 
like every day there's 500 games released to the Apple App Store. And there's 40 games released to Steam every single day. And with AI coming into the equation, I think these numbers will explode. So it's going to be really interesting to see how this will affect the marketing side of things and the UA landscape when the competition is going to get even fiercer and, and, and fiercer. Yeah. And of course, you know, the UA is a really good, good point for sure. And of course, you know, uh, you know, creating game content might become much easier, faster. So of course, might affect live ops. You know, I don't know if we're gonna see all the casual games have massive live ops like COD, COD Mobile or something like that. Maybe we will see something like that. And also, you know, talking about just you know the scale of games that you can create. So we we talk about uh, earlier about the Genshin type of games like the Zelda Zero and and those games, which require you know massive you know amount of workforce to create all that the, the huge large worlds and the content there. So if that becomes easier, you can you know scale massive worlds. Could we see mm -hmm. more of these open world type of games in the market? Could we see maybe the MMORPG genre doing a massive comeback in the future? Can we see like more of these metaverse type of games actually coming to the live. I don't know if it's going to be already in the 2024, but forward to that, yeah, might might <laughs> something interesting might happen there. Whether AI just sort of allows people to speed up what they're already doing, which obviously it will do. You know, is that going to be the core sort of um, result, at least in 2024, or is it going to allow sort of totally new sorts of sort of content to be made? that couldn't have been made before, which I guess is sort of a harder, AI probably won't come up with that itself, maybe it will, <laughs> but there's a hard, hard thing to come, to come up with. So so is it sort of just it sort of accelerating existing trends um, or, or is it sort of coming up with totally new things? One thing I, I want to add to this, that at Game Refinery, we're obviously always on the lookout for, for any sort of like mm. uh, evidence of AI generated content in games. And in China, we actually, we've seen it in use in the, in the currently the, in the top, MMO in the market called Nishui Han, which is uh, from NetEase. Uh, so they have used these large language models to generate at least certain amount of the narrative content that they have in the game. Uh, so they have used this, 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 this the, 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 they have used AI to, to help them to, to design the narrative there. there. So uh, yeah, uh, will be, will definitely be interesting. And then uh, I guess what I also believe is that that this will result probably in even faster copying of game features and art styles and all kinds of assets that we have in the game. So, so if you can just make prompts like, please generate a Clash Royale like Battle Pass for my game and one click and it's yeah. there, that's that's gonna be quite groundbreaking. Also, the other thing with like this that comes in is it's not the fact that sort of you know you can see how it's gonna make all games better but it's i think it's hard for the individual developer to see how it makes them competitively gives them a competitive advantage if everyone has access to the same tools then you know maybe this everything gets better but how does that make your game stand out from all the other ones particularly if it's gonna be sort of loads more games I, I guess that's the really tricky thing that developers are gonna to have to come to terms with is, is what's their competitive advantage in in that sort of landscape i guess we'll have to ask chat gpt to see if it can tell us <laughs> cool so plenty to look forward to um thank you uh thank you for all the games as well it's always good to get sort of some some some, some titles we can sort of uh, start start checking out and, and look forward to but uh, thank you for your expertise uh, wilhelm and uh, calais thank you thank you and i thank you to you for watching uh, listening to the podcast however you are consuming it uh, of course every episode we are delving into what's going on in the mobile game space which is the uh, most dynamic and the largest uh, gaming sector so we hope you are enjoying the shows uh, obviously do subscribe to get all our episodes and uh, we'll see you next time goodbye